Good afternoon, pleasure to be here. I want to talk this afternoon about the evolution of tall buildings and I'm gonna attempt to look back 50 years and forward 50 years. Um, we are in Chicago, which is a city of towers, or at least where they originated. And as I came to architecture a long time ago, our models were the generation of the first generation of the modern movement that tried to make sense of how towers make a city. How do they coalesce to make urban place? And Le Corbusier, Mies, Hilversheimer, uh, basically were trying to imagine the city and transportation in a new way. Looking back, for us, it's easy. Um, they didn't create credible public realm, and they were prisoners of the concept that the tower is an extrusion of the extended ground plane and the ground plan. When I was uh, a student, I had the good fortune to have a fellowship to study housing, and these concepts were being translated in every city in North America into housing and office buildings that were still in that realm. And it was my generation that started thinking, can we rethink the city and can we rethink the tower in new ways? And after Bjorka's presentation, I said the next generation is continuing. Um, I'm, obviously, this trip led me to rethink the apartment building. Uh, can we give every apartment a sense of house? Can we do so in a way that diffuses the tension between people wanting, those who can afford it, in the suburbs and houses, and live in the city. But before I show you Habitat as you know it, I want to show you the initial proposal, now forgotten, that I presented to the government when we came for approval. This was one of the early diagrams, and it said, we think of towers as individual buildings with their own cores connected by the ground plane. We must think about them as a fabric of the city connected in many planes. And this sketch made in 63 was trying to imagine what this is in the way of a community that has this multi-layered connectivity. And the original habitat proposal was more intense, larger, 26 stories high with A-frames, and it managed to get the urban environment in terms of all the components of community in a multi-layered way into the complex. When we presented it, the government said, we don't have the time or the resources, but you could build that little part down there. And I was so disappointed that I thought I'm gonna walk off the job. But I didn't. And Habitat was a result of trying to resolve this question. Can we fractalize the tower? Can we cease thinking of it as an extrusion so that we can get gardens, public and private. Can we prefabricate those structures? And here you see the building 50 years later, living happily ever after with the pattern now of life, the streets that serve the houses, open uh, to the weather, etc., etc. 1973, I had the good fortune to visit, visit Beijing. There wasn't a single high-rise building in Beijing or Shanghai. I went back in the 80s and the extraordinary density, uh, all the entire city made up of the fabric of tall buildings was a reality. The densities we imagined in the 60s were nothing compared with the reality of today. And particularly in Asia, but almost everywhere, these densities are, are, are game changers. So in 1910, we decided to rethink habitat. Can we meet those densities? Can we um, create mixed-use communities and not just think in terms of residential? And these series of studies led to many, many explorations it was done as a fellowship in the office. 
And these were all the models that had accumulated at the end of one year. And I'm going to show you one of those outcomes, one of those systems, which was to rethink New York in terms of the identical density and identical mix of uses. We mapped those densities and quantified them and then worked on the rearrange rearrangement of the identical density. And this was the outcome in terms of layering offices, housing, the public realm at the ground plane and the public realm on the 25th level that interfaces between residential and office, et cetera. And of course, this was independent of site, theoretic, theoretical study. We managed to get a great deal of the fractalization, the gardens, the private and public outdoor spaces. And we also managed to make the building porous. The 75-story structure with the FAR of 12 managed to get views through the building. So if it's built along Central Park or if it's built along um, the East River, it doesn't form a wall. You can see through it, which is such a fundamental issue with tall buildings. And as good fortune is it, from research to reality, we had the opportunity to apply. Uh, this is, I'm proud to say, middle income housing in Singapore, 600 families. And we have the opportunity to explore creating public uh, bridges for the community at the various levels of the building. There are hundreds of children in this building. It's working and operating as a kind of real community of middle income families. And then in China, in Qingwandao, again, middle income along the coast, um, trying to break up the building to fractalize it, to create the urban windows, the outdoor spaces, etc. In Colombo, similarly pursuing this search. As we came to work on Marina Bay Sands, which now is about 15 years ago. There was another component that fascinated us, which is how do these great mixed-use projects of great density create truly a public realm? Sometimes I've been asked, were you interested in working on a casino? I said the casino for me was incidental. Marina Bay Sands was an opportunity to create public realm to show its potential. And the clue was this diagram of the Urban Redevelopment Authority of Singapore that aimed to show that they, that showed that they want to create a continuous public realm around the Singapore River and around the harbor or the bay, what became the bay, as a continuous network of urban life. And so what the project actually proposed is that the waterfront, which would be a promenade, would then become an indoor space which integrates with it. And then every layer on the fifth level and the 59th level become layers of public space. The, river, the waterside promenade, the internal air conditioned weaving in and out of outdoor spaces, the hotel atrium becoming truly public streets and public right-of-ways. And finally, the roof of the structure becoming a great resource of outdoor spaces, parks, swimming pools, etc. I remember the day when we had the three models, we ran out of space. We had no more space to put the, all the amenities that go with the term integrated resort. Parks and this and that. There was this big piece of plywood, and I put it on the model. I said, why don't we put it up there? And the client present said, are you out of your mind? <laughs> well, it uh, seemed to work. <laughs> Raffles City that followed Marina Bay 
was actually more complex and more difficult in the sense that it concentrated on a third the land, 12 million square feet. And also, because its place in the city was by definition uh, very demanding. The piece of land is right behind that piazza that already existed. The city uh, leaders realized that this site is, is central to the image of the city, and so they run three competitions, actually they run two competitions, selected no project, we came in on the third one. And I realized that symbolically the site had to do something beyond just fulfill the program. And in the tradition that the convergence of the two rivers, the Yangtze and the Jialing, created this spot which is called the Emperor's Landing, the big shipping center of the Yangtze River, I thought the buildings could evoke that sense of sailboat, of the sailing, of the marine culture. And also at the same time resolve the many very complex urban issues that the dead end site, the equivalent of Lower Manhattan presents. And this being the model that we submitted in the competition and the mix of uses of residential, office, hotel, um, two million square feet of retail, a major subway station, a major bus terminal, a major shipping, uh, passenger shipping terminal uh, coming together were two diagrams. One was that this project that was that dead end of the city or the gateway to the city would extend the streets of the city right through the project so that the kind of privatization that occurs in projects of that scale would be reversed and this would just become part of the fabric of the streets of the city. And in the section what you see is that the red which connects the upper level of the city to the plaza level, which is the extension of these streets as commercial thoroughfares, also allow you to walk on the roof of the podium to become a public park. And so the public realm in two ways contributes to the city. It extends the street, connects them to the piazza, which is a symbolic place, and it creates a major public park as part of the complex. Uh, the project is partially open uh, and will be completed all phases of it by March. You can see here the kind of layering of the podium and the park on top and the conservatory. Now, let me talk about the conservatory in the sense of evolution. In Marina Bay Sands, basically we created a park with lots of amenities, but it was not yet an integral part of the programming of the building. Chongqing has a very difficult climate, 40 degrees centigrade at summer and a cold winter. We decided to create a conservatory, a space that could be active year round and contribute to the programming of the building. And so, as you see it here, various views in the city. Whoops, I'm missing a couple of slides here. Or not. There it is, the, the cross section through the conservatory, a kind of a glass structure that spans, I learned in the earlier presentation this afternoon, longest in the world, I didn't know that. Uh, and you see here the first shots of the interior, and it accommodates swimming pools and clubs and the hotel public spaces and uh, restaurants, and I expect that it will become a very vital, a life place in the life of the city. It is served by separate system of elevators as well as connecting all the towers in terms of the residents within it. And for the 70th anniversary of the revolution, we, thanks to LED, were able to switch the lights from white to red to celebrate China's Revolution Day. Um, 
Currently, we're trying to expand this idea of connectivity between buildings. We're doing so with the constraint that these are still, still single projects, single architect, single client. But in Seoul, Korea, a complex about the same size as Chongqing, multiple bridging serves different uses. And the most exciting to us is one sky park that will serve for agriculture. Uh, the client here is Harim, the largest uh, food processor in Korea, and they're really interested in creating a place where they can grow the food and serve it within the project. They also have, as you can see underground, the largest logistics manufacturing space ever done underground, eight levels of manufacturing and logistics which accommodated below the project. And the streets again weave into the project and create a kind of continuity with the surrounding city, the growing of the food and the uh, commercial retail area within the project. Looking ahead, and perhaps that's the most important con conclusion I'd like to reach. This is Mondrian's uh, 1941 painting, New York. And I love that painting in terms of what it might suggest about where we go forward. I think that uh, until now, we've come to certain realizations that we can rethink the tower, be it residential, workspace, as a kind of emerging new typology. We understand the potential, and we've seen it in this conference and previous conferences, of the next generation thinking beyond the extrusion into the creation of open space, into the question of daylight that we've, that, that the greater the density, the greater the challenge of maintaining these basic amenities that we always have taken for granted. And I don't think densities will reduce in the near future. And we've also realized, I think, collectively, that the connectivity between buildings has great potential for many reasons, but it creates extraordinary spaces. It creates a fabric of movement that's more efficient than just a ground plane. But until now, we've been constrained. Everything I showed you today, and I think almost everything we saw in the conference, has been single project, single architect, single site. What happens next, and I think we're, we can have a hint here of New York 41, which is maybe more like New York 2051, the Mondrian leaving his two-dimensional plane, beginning to think of the layering of multiple networks. Um, maybe I'm extending his imagination into mine, but it seems to me that the next step is to figure out how do you take an urban district and create a master plan or an urban design that establishes these different networks at various levels. How do you create a set of rules about the preservation and conservation of daylight and some open views in terms of the clustering of the towers. And then how do you combine that with the emerging typology that we see springing out that makes these buildings more livable, more usable, more enjoyable into something that can be done by several developers and several architects and coalesces to make the sum total greater than the individual parts. And I think this would take a breakthrough in our attitude towards urban design and towards planning. Everything today within the system, and it doesn't matter whether it's an autocratic system like China or whether it's a democratic system, I was going to say like the United States, I hope. Uh, <laughs> You never know. Uh, uh, that, that enables this kind of planning. And 
urban design has been so badly discredited and the shift to give the full responsibility to developers and not to the whatever administration there is has been what's responsible for the fact that we've lost the public realm. The public realm has been totally privatized. It, I mean, so many of the malls all over Asia and everywhere else are really privatized spaces that siphon life from the city. And so I hope we will find the tools and the will to start thinking of districts in that way so that uh, several of us on different sites, working for different people, have a bigger goal. We tested that in a studio that I did with my colleague Jaron Lubin at the GSD at Harvard this semester, where we created together with the students first a three-dimensional master plan for what the district should be. And then each student took one site and developed this within the agreed model. We did that for Hudson Bay last year, and you wouldn't be surprised, but the results were much more exciting than what's, what is there now, and that was with GSD students. So I hope that as we go forward, this next step of the three-dimensional integration of urban districts uh, is the next challenge for the generation after you, Bjorke. <laughs> <laughs>